Emeritus Professor of the University of London, here to talk to La Cercle Française de Guernesey this evening about the linguistic relationships between French and English. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. <laughs> now, the linguistic relationships between French and English, I mean, uh, there are all sorts of relationships. Are we talking purely about the, the root of the word, or are we talking wider than that? Well, you know that the French are getting very anxious about the number of borrowings from English. They talk about le franglais, they talk as if the French language was on the point of disintegrating under this flood of borrowings. Well, I feel that uh, this is really uh, very much uh, exaggerated fear, given uh, if you compare with English, the fact that English uh, is uh, so full of French words and it seems to me that it's uh, doing quite well, thank you. Um, this is because of the Norman Conquest bringing the French language to Britain. Um, admittedly, the, uh, it was the ruling classes who uh, spoke French, but um, Obviously, if you wanted to get on in uh, the, 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 the Britain of uh, uh, the 11th or 12th century, you had to learn French. And I think probably um, the process of borrowing into what had become a very secondary language, English, uh, started off fairly gently with a, a number of borrowings in the Norman forms, like cat, uh, castle, um, cart, carriage, and so on, which, um, if you compare with the French, have this ca um, instead of the French sh. And uh, if, if you know Guernsey French, I'm sure that the word for cat there is car, at least it is in Jersey. <laughs> uh, so that was the start. Then uh, in the 13th century, the, the real flood of borrowings, and then, in fact, I mean, you know, if you look at the uh, English vocabulary and compare it with that of, say, German, uh, they're totally different uh, languages. And in fact, English is a sort of hybrid uh, with a very, very big content of Romance, Greek. Uh, I would say Romance is, you know, from the uh, Romance languages, yes. which include Italian, but primarily French. But, I mean, what, what I find interesting, Professor, is that you talk about people in Britain having been uh, occupied by the Norman French mm. and the Norman French court, one presumes, of mm. William. They would have been speaking uh, a French that would have presumably differentiated from the French that was spoken, say, in Paris. Yes. Um, I, I don't know whether... You know, all uh, William's uh, followers were Normans, and indeed uh, not all Normans have this particular characteristic that I mentioned, mm. because there is a, a boundary, linguistic boundary, below which um, uh, the Latin K before A became SH in the same way that it did in most of the other parts of France. Um, and I think that um, as time went on, I mean, the influence became less Norman. I mean, the Angevins, for instance, uh, came from Anjou and didn't speak Norman, uh, and um, a sort of French uh, of England developed, and I mean, Anglo-Norman has various characteristics which I don't know a great deal about, but for instance the word aunt is written A-U-N-T, which suggests that um, it was pronounced uh, not as in old French, aunt, but aunt, or something like that, I don't know whether yeah. sort of uh, funny pronunciation of the nasal when uh, I don't know about Guernsey French, but Jersey French has some very funny nasal, nasal vowels. So that one sees the thread of the French importation into English as we have just grown up with it. But right now, um, well, I mean, in the last 20 years or so, the French have been terribly concerned about the, you know, the transposing of English words into their language. Yes, but what they don't seem to realize is that uh, there are Anglicisms and Anglicisms, and uh, the ones that they get het up about are the ones which have this obvious English form, uh, like le fast food or whatever it may be. <laughs> le weekend. Le weekend. But then, I mean, le weekend, I would have thought, was so well uh, accepted by the French that it would be very difficult to get rid of it. I think somebody has suggested talking about Sanders' men instead. 
But, uh, you know, there are masses and masses of borrowing from English which they don't notice because they have exactly the same sort of form as, uh, as ordinary French words. I mean, I'll give you an example, the word population. I mean, there's a borrowing from English. You wouldn't know, would you? Uh, the word contraception is a fairly recent borrowing from English, and so is malnutrition, and so on. So the Transportation? I'm not sure about yeah. that. Um, but, but, but television, uh, telephone, yeah. and so on. These are um, words which I suppose were technical innovations which originated in either America or Britain. Um, but because of their form, uh, they do not look uh, any different and are therefore not, not, uh, you know, oh, Yes, that's right. I mean, what, there must be then, in a sense, a, um, a difference between the English view of their language and the French view of their language. Well, yes, I mean, um, if you consider the attitude of the average uh, educated English speaker to French, I think it is a very, um, favorable one. I mean, they're always bringing in uh, French words like uh, raison d'être and joie de vivre yes. and all that. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and there isn't this feeling that, you know, this is, a, this is, this is rather wicked. Uh, the British government, uh, as far as I know, has no policy about language whatever. Whereas since the 16th century or so, the French have become very conscious of the need to preserve the language. Mm. And uh, this, I suppose, um, started uh, with, um, you know, the reaction not to borrowing from English, but to borrowing from Italian in the 16th century, because there was a lot of borrowing from Italian then. English had been nowhere up till then. I mean, was Latin uh, an important thread in all of this? Well, in both, in both, in both uh, uh, English and French, obviously, uh, Latin was the source from which you built up your technical and, and uh, abstract vocabulary. And in French, I mean, you can distinguish uh, on the basis of their form the what they call popular development of words and the learned equivalent. And so you have, in some cases, doublets, so called, one of which is the popular, and one the other which is the uh, learned uh, equivalent, and sometimes the meaning is quite different. Uh, we have poison, for instance, and potion, or ra raison, and ration, and so on, yeah. which are, you know, exactly the same Latin word, but one in its learned form. Uh, and because of this close connection between uh, French um, and English in the Middle Ages with the period of bilingualism, I mean, these sort of words came into English as well. And I think this sort of thing is uh, much more noticeable to somebody who knows German, say. I mean, I, I, know, I don't know Dutch or any of the other um, Germanic languages, but I do know German. And I mean, every, every, every time you compare English and German, you find that the English is much more Latinate or French than the German. And um, this is extended even to the modern period when, so we had television and the French television, but the Germans call it Fernsehen, and so they've adapted, they've translated. Uh, and of course, this also happened to English words in French or French words in English. I mean, the third world is from the tiers monde, the French tiers monde, and Graciel is from the American English skyscraper. I mean, yes. uh, that is known as loan translation. And again, these are, generally speaking, forms that nobody get worried about. It's this, this, this sort of weekend uh, gadget and, and, and all these forms that really uh, it make them very irritable. But I mean, I feel that their worry is uh, quite uh, disproportionate because, you know, I don't think that even if you had a lot of English looking and English sounding words, as you do to some extent, um, there's nothing really to worry about. The language will cope. I mean, do you feel that the French uh, somehow have a sort of siege mentality about the value of their language to the world and their culture generally, that they somehow feel it's, it's, it's going to be undermined by the rabble outside of their borders? Yes, indeed. And uh, I mean, a lot of uh, French writers have written in the this sort of 
turn, sort of turns, um, as if they thought that, you know, the uh, importation of hamburgers and hot dogs was going to ruin France. Well, I mean, you know, you can take them or leave them. <laughs> and, um, but they do seem, as a, as a community, as a nation state, to be very concerned to, as they would see it, it almost seems to me, for the benefit of the world, the French language must remain pure and unadulterated. Yes, well, I mean, uh, I, I've been talking at greater length about that sort of thing tonight, but I mean, there, uh, from the 17th century on, there's been this um, idea that the French language has had reached its perfect state and should be kept in that state. And so even in the 19th century, when Émile Littré produced his famous dictionary of the French language, I mean, most of the examples he used were taken from 17th century texts or 18th mm -hmm. century. He wasn't at all modern in his uh, outlook. And even today, I mean, you know, the um, attitude, I'd say, of some French people and primarily, you know, teachers and so on is very much, you know, trying to keep the language the way it's always been and should be, the real French, whereas, I mean, the ordinary man in the street is, is playing around with the language in a terrible way. I mean, I mean, is, it, is it a bit like King Canute? I mean, they're just not going to stop it. Well, there have been what you might call some victories over the Franglais, for instance. I mean, we had this lecturer over in Jersey, and he spoke to us about the French language, and he was very proud of the victory of the word ordinateur over the word computer. So, you know, I mean, he regarded this as a sort of major achievement. Well, I mean, you know, if you had called it the computer, I'm sure everybody would have accepted it perfectly. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there was this feeling that, you know, this is an important scientific technological sphere, and so we mustn't talk about computers and software. We must have... We must have our own words. Yeah. Yes. It, it's... I mean, you obviously, as a professor studying languages, re must recognise that languages aren't set in aspect, are they? No, they're not. Never have been. No, I mean, if if, um, if the French uh, were really um, wanting to stop change, I think then there are a lot of things which are obviously happening, uh, which they should be equally worried about, in you know, in terms of. Um, you know, the, the, the syntax of the, of the language, there are considerable differences between the average spoken French forms and the written French forms. And this is because they've kept the sort of um, iron fist for, you know, the written language. So they can't stop people from changing the spoken language, or they not to the same extent. Is the same thing happening in English? I don't think it's happening to the same extent. I think that the uh, gap between the written and spoken languages uh, has never been as great. So obviously, if you compare the sort of English that you know, bureaucrats write and, and the things that people say, there is a gap. Uh, but, um, uh, I mean, there are interesting um, investigations. Uh, I'll give you one example. Um, you know that Strictly speaking, the written negative in French consists of a ne and a pa or point or whatever it may be. Well, in the spoken language, ne is being dropped to no end. And so you say, je sais pas, I don't know, not je ne sais pas. And uh, one of the uh, investigations uh, involves an academic gentleman, and in his lecture, the nerves were all there, but in his private conversation, they disappeared. <laughs> so he, he had the sort of consciousness that in certain environments, such as the lecture hall, he had to speak proper. <laughs> speak proper. <laughs> and, but, you know, it. informally, he was following everybody else. Marvellous. Oh, I mean, language, is, language and the study of language is obviously fascinating to you, Professor. Oh, well, I mean, you know, yes, it is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure this evening the, uh, the Cirque Francais, I should say Francais, not Francais, shouldn't mm -hmm. I? Yes, the Cirque Francais, the dernier day, going to have a fascinating talk this evening. Uh, I think that it probably will be rather tough going, but um, uh -huh. I'll do my best. Well, I mean, it certainly hasn't been tough going, and we've been talking for a good 20 minutes, you know, Professor, so far this mm -hmm. morning, and it hasn't been tough going at all. I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating lecture. Tonight at the Cape Hill Centre at 8 o'clock, Professor Nicole Spence talking on the linguistic relationships between French and English.
Thank you very much for joining me this morning, Professor. Thank you.